Good morning. Welcome to Riverlawn Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you've joined us. We want to reiterate, uh, if, if you've been worshiping with us for a while or this is your first time, we're glad that you're here. We hope you're able to share this with others. We want to let others be a part of this time of unique fellowship, even as virtually we, we come together one in spirit. And also we know that this is a time where we're still longing for the, uh, that connection. God's created us for that community. So if there's a way that we can be uh, a supportive to you, uh, if you have a need or, or prayer request, I would be honored to talk with you and to pray with you uh, in, in the time ahead. We want to lift you up and, and celebrate what God is doing in our midst and also carry one another's burdens. So we, we want to give that opportunity to you. Also, this morning, we're go we are going to be focusing on our first love. That was of greatest importance. And so we pray that this is a time where we are, again, reawakened and drawn back to our first love. And that is our prayer for you as well. And so as we begin worship this morning, we need to prepare our hearts as we go before our first love, the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. And so uh, Pam has prepared for us our prelude. And I pray that this is a prayer of our hearts uh, and, and the cry of our hearts, create me a clean heart. on us according to your unfailing love because against you we have sinned and we pray please Lord blot out our sin cleanse us and we will be clean wash us and we will be radiant create in us those pure hearts for you are a merciful God and we pray that you renew within us a spirit that is steadfast for our first love, Jesus. Lord, restore in us the joy of your salvation. O oh, merciful Savior, we pray in your name. Amen. And amen. And we hear this good news, this promise from 1 John chapter 4. Hear this word. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. 
And if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is glorious good news. Thanks be to God. And in that spirit of the love of God lavished on us and how we are able to offer that love back to him, uh, this is a time where we can proclaim our longing and love for the Lord in our opening hymn uh, as the deer. Again, I pray that that's our heart cry, that we long for the Lord, that we thirst for him more than anything else in this world. So let's turn to God's word as we hear more about this in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. We're beginning uh, to look at the seven letters to the seven churches. And so these are Jesus' words that he told John to write down to the church in Ephesus. Hear the word of the Lord. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, 
which I also hate. So whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we come once again to your word, we pray that your spirit will illumine, that we will hear from your spirit, that we will hear from you, Lord Jesus, that you will not only show us that we might have understanding, but that you will convict and compel so that we respond, that we return to our first love. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So this morning, we're actually going to be talking about an issue that's more vitally important than national elections or international recessions or even global pandemics. There is a threat to the church and to our souls which is more insidious than anything that you're going to hear or read in the news. We're going to discuss this morning the single most crucial issue in all the Christian faith and life. And my prayer for us this morning is that we will respond wisely. So we're continuing our series on the book of Revelation. Today we begin looking at the first letter to the seven churches, the first of which is to Ephesus. And so we need to start by asking, what do we know about this city? Well, Ephesus was located on the southwestern corner of what the ancients knew as Asia Minor, what we call now Turkey, and her very name means desirable. And she was the city that was often called Lumen Asia, the light of Asia. Okay, and so there's a lot of things we, we do know. We know that it was a very political city, very important politically. The Roman governor uh, that oversaw the, 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 the entire region lived there and would carry out and try all the important cases in this city. And also Ephesus was host of the, um, let me say this right, Pananian Games, which in their day was just as prestigious as the Olympics. So I just want you to imagine, imagine standing on the floor of the Colosseum there and putting your foot uh, in the deep marble ruts from the, the Roman chariots or standing in the stands and looking down in stands where the Apostle Paul would have sat and, and proclaimed the gospel. Imagine the grandeur of this city. Okay, so to the eye, it's very magnificent. And Ephesus was not only a very political city, it was also a very religious city. In fact, the most religious city on the continent. Not one, not two, but three temples stood in tribute of her worship to the emperor, which we've talked about before, that they were commanded to worship the emperor as God. So there was a, a, an emperor cult. Now, there was also the gods of the people, right? We, there's Artemis. Diana, goddess of fertility, uh, and was, was worshipped across the region. But it was here in Ephesus that her temple was. And it was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Just imagine 127 columns, each reaching 60 feet high, many of which are covered with precious stones and precious metals. Okay, So this was very uh, um, ornate. So... We think about all of this, and we think a lot of that's pagan. But what about the church in Ephesus? The congregation was probably founded by Priscilla and Aquila. They were later joined by Paul, who preached there for uh, two years. We also know that Timothy pastored there. We know that the beloved disciple John pastored there. Tradition holds that after Jesus committed his mother into John's hands, and the, look at your mother, look at your son, that John took Mary, the mother of Jesus, to the city with him, uh, and that this is the city where John is buried. And, and after Rome destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, uh, really the center of Christianity shifted to this church and this city. So it was of great religious point, uh, importance to the church, early church. But what can we learn? What can we learn from the church in Ephesus? Because Jesus' words to them actually reveal a great bit to us. And we don't want to miss the first part because often we tend to focus on 
uh, the, the, the criticism and the, the, the call to respond, which is central. But we also need to see what's going on first. Jesus first commends the church in wonderful ways, more so than most of the other churches. He applauds their actions in verse 2. I know your deeds and hard work. He commends their perseverance. We see that word twice in just a few verses. It's a word that means to endure with steadfast courage despite all opposition. So this is a word talking about the persecution that they have faced because of their faith in Jesus Christ. He also affirms their integrity of faith, that they have integrity of theology. He says this in verse 2 as well. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have, you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Now again, it's when we hear tolerate wicked people, that are we supposed to tolerate? Well, the emphasis here is we're not to be tolerating false doctrine because it leads astray, even to the degree of being led away from Christ. So this is of, of incredible importance. And later on in verse 6, Jesus commends them specifically for rejecting the practices of the Nicolaitans. We don't know a lot about the Nicolaitans. We do know that they were an early uh, heretical cult uh, known for self-indulgent behavior, immorality, even idolatry, because they took that idea of God's grace and used it as a license for sin which goes against the gospel. So it was this early cult, and that's why Jesus is commending them for rejecting that. But the, this is the thing, though. gets gets to the gritty now. Uh, the, the Ephesians have a problem. There is a spiritual malignancy growing in their hearts, and left unchecked, it'll lead to destruction. Jesus laments to them in verse 4. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. It's a powerful verse, a central verse. At first means first in time. So they have forsaken the one that they loved first when they came to Christ, when they became Christians. They have forsaken that love for Jesus. And so this church has gotten so busy with the work of the Lord that they have forgotten how to walk with the Lord. That they are consumed with doing and have lost being. I can think of the Mary Martha image. It keeps pocketing in my head. And, and they're focusing on the work at the expense of the worship, which is to be central. So Jesus' lament turns into a warning in verse 5. He says, consider how far you have fallen. Exclamation point. It's right there. Repent and do the things that you did at first. Because if you do not return, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place. What does that mean? Well, again, as we discussed last week, the lampstand refers to each church. But not only to the church, but to the mission with which they had been entrusted. Bearing forth Jesus, the light of the world. You don't hide your light under a bushel, you put it on a lampstand. And so this is talking about the church and the mission of the church. And so if they chose not to return to their first love fully so that they could reflect his light faithfully, Jesus is blunt. He's going to remove their church. That's the emphasis here. And now this letter is in God's word for the Ephesian church, but it applied not just to them, it applies to us as well. That if we forsake our first love, the same thing can happen to us, individually and as a church. And so this is the important question to ask. How does forsaking our first love happen? How does it happen? Well, it happens when religion replaces relationships. The Ephesians were busy beyond words. Their deeds, their hard work, their perseverance were all consuming. And the relationship that they once had with Jesus now becomes a religion for him. And that happens in other relationships as well, right? We think, I think especially of marriages. That we were so close at first when we had no one but each other. Just that sense of attention and focus. But then things change, right? We, we think about, you know, there's jobs, and houses, cars, children come along, there's the bills and the responsibilities, and you may, before you even realize it, it looks more like a business partnership, right? And the same thing can happen with our souls in Jesus. When he was our first love, he was the center. 
You know him but him. That's who was most important in our life. Everything else was centered around him, not the activities or the schedules or the programs. But then over time, our devotion for Jesus, displayed through our living for Jesus, shifts. And our service loses its center. And our relationship with the bridegroom ends up looking more like that business partnership. We get so busy with the work for the Lord, work of the Lord, that we lose touch with the Lord of the work. And there's a difference. I hope you see the difference. So religion replaces relationship. That's the first uh, bad sign. But there's another one. When complacency replaces passion. The Ephesians had their act together. They were the leading church in the leading city in their entire region. In their part of the world. All must be well. That's dangerous thinking. It was dangerous thinking for them and dangerous thinking for us. We can think we don't even realize it. We, we may think, you know, our marriage must be healthy since there's no fighting. You know, our kids are doing well. Our, our finances are in order. We, we have enough status to be successful. And so we can stop investing in our relationships simply by making the assumption that they are strong and will continue to be so. It's dangerous. The passion we had at first is replaced by a complacency at all that we have achieved. Until we look back and it's too late. And so it is with our souls. You know, we, we typically we think of here we are in church. You're not in the sanctuary with me, but we have gathered as the church. And often when we're driving to one place or another, we drive by and pass by all our neighbors who aren't. And are we thinking of them? But we think we're, doing, we're, we're living good lives. We're doing good things. We must be right with God. He must be pleased with us. But that's the kind of thinking that, change, that causes complacency and how it replaces passion. We have to be careful. And one day we wake up and we realize that we've lost that love for Jesus. That we work for him now, but it's not driven by our devotion of him. That we worship him with our lips, but not with our hearts. That we read and pray and give and serve, but it's all part of our routine, right? Commitments we've made, bills to pay, obligations to keep. It's all part of the process that we're so used to. It's habitual. But we come, the fact is we come because it's Sunday. Not because he's our first love. And that's the change that we see. And when that happens, we're not the church anymore. That's a scary thing to think of. No, we're now a religious organization, a social club offering a Bible study. Yes, we can do good charitable work for our community. We are called to do that. That is a central aspect of our faith. It is the purpose of the church. And we provide fellowship for our members. Again, central aspect of the church. But if we're not adoring Jesus... Can we call ourselves a church? Jesus, think about this. Jesus, the perfect son of God, enter a world full of darkness and despair to suffer unimaginably and to conquer death itself. Why? To redeem for himself a bride. You and me. Made new and devoted to him. The church is the bride of Christ. We are not living as the church if we are not living for him if he is not our first love so Jesus's warning to the church in Ephesus is his warning to us I will come to you and will remove your lampstand from its place and so this is the sobering truth this is the sobering truth to the church in Ephesus and to us today when our love disappears soon our light will disappear as well and that's what happened in Ephesus the church died and the city with her, the temple of Diana, 127 pillars covered with precious stones and metals. This ancient wonder of the world is just one pillar today with a bird's nest on top of it. That's to give you a sense of where we're going with this. That there is no Ephesus and no Ephesian church this morning. What happened to them can happen to the church anywhere, even here, even us. This is humbling and sobering. And so I ask, does any of this describe you? 
Does it describe you? If it doesn't, if you are not living in Ephesus today, be grateful to God. Rejoice in him. Renew your passion, your unconditional commitment to your first love today and be encouraged by his word. But if it does, if you do find yourself living in Ephesus this morning, know that it's not too late. Same message just to us. This letter of Christ comes to us today with the same opportunity that was given to the church in Ephesus. And so the question for us this morning is, what do we do? It's just like when Peter was preaching uh, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And they were cut to the heart and they asked, what shall we do? And Jesus tells us three things in verse 5. Jesus cries out to us, first, remember. Remember how far you've fallen. This is, a, this is a call to humbly acknowledge our state, but also to recall where we were. Remember when you were in love with your Lord, when you prayed because you wanted to be with him, when you read his word because you wanted to hear from him, when you worshiped because you wanted to honor him, when you gave and when you served and when you witnessed because you wanted to give back to him. Now maybe, maybe you don't remember a time when you were in love with Jesus this way. Today can be that day. Today can be that day for you. You can surrender to him and offer your life to him and grow and learn that love for him. Okay? And so what do we do next? Not only are we to remember Jesus, then declares repent. Change. Turn from where you are and profess again, profess anew the love you once had. Decide that you want him to be your first love again. Remember, repent, and then Jesus says, return. Jesus adds, do the things you did at first. Don't wait until you feel love for Jesus. Act out that love for Jesus. If Jesus were your first love today, what would you do? How would that be reflected in your life? What person would you forgive or seek forgiveness from? What wrong would you make right? What resource would you give? What ambition would you surrender? What lost person would you pray for and seek by God's grace and power to win for Christ? What service would you render? Do that. Do it now. Do it while you have the opportunity. See, any of us can be in Ephesus today. I know because I've been there as well. And I'm not talking about the actual city. I'm talking about been there and this place where they found themselves. Because when I first trusted in Jesus as a child, it was as though a new world had opened before my eyes. The mystery of it all. God's word was this exciting mystery. And being with, with God's family and, and, and learning more and more about the astonishing love of Jesus just excited me. It was the greatest joy. All of it was exciting. None of it was routine. I didn't know what routine was. But that changed. Over time, it changed. I became a professional. I had an office where I studied, I preached sermons, and I led Bible studies, and slowly, subtly, work was replacing worship. That it wasn't grounded and driven by that worship, that relationship. Times when I preached because it was my responsibility, not because God had given me a gift and a word that I couldn't wait to share with his people. Times when I ministered to others because it was my place rather than my great privilege. And I wish I could say that this was only one time in the past and I overcame it, done with. But the truth is, as, as a sinner still awaiting glory, I continue to struggle in keeping Christ centered as my first love. Of, of fostering that relationship before anything else, that, that there aren't those idols that crowd in and, and grab my affections and attentions. We get pulled by those things in this world, and it pulls us away from our first love. We need to be fostering that relationship. And there were times, plenty of times, 
when I was struggling to keep Christ centered. But thank God, by his grace, there have also been those times of remembering, repenting, and returning. Times such as in, in college when I served with a, a ministry called New Life, which worked with um, uh, delinquent youth at George Jr. Republic. Or when I was just in awe of the splendor of God's creation in the summers where I worked uh, park ministers in a uh, Christian ministry in the National Park national parks, or, or seeing the joy of Christ in the face of a child in Colombia, or being humbled by the hospitality of Christ embodied in my sisters and brothers of Christ in Kenya, or being overwhelmed by the faithfulness and servanthood of members of Riverlawn Presbyterian Church again and again and again. All of these were times when Jesus spoke to my heart, called me back to himself. Times when the Spirit of God moved in me in powerful ways where pain was met with the comfort of the shepherd. Where lack was met with supply, fear with peace, despair with hope, hate with love, death with life. This is the power of the gospel. But all of this grace, all of this glory points to something still to come. And we encounter it in our very last verse where Jesus says to you and me, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is significant. This call to overcome, to be victorious is found in every one of the seven letters to the seven churches. Jesus reiterates the purpose of his words to his churches. That as the one who has overcome the world, sin, Satan, and death, he tells us that we are now able to do the same in him. That we are called to do the same in him. And that by returning to our first love, we are now able to re reflect his, his light. And as those who belong to him and who abide in him, we will share in his victory. Where? Where will this happen? Where will this be? In that place of restore, perfect, unending fellowship with our great God, where we will partake of the life and the presence of Christ now and forever. Forever. Jesus says the paradise of God, that image of garden, that image of his glorious presence forever. Because of his victory and our call to live pursuing our first love because of his victory. So I end with this. I end with this challenge, this charge. If you are lingering in Ephesus instead of longing for eternity, I urge you to hear what the Spirit has said to the church. What Jesus says to you and me. Remember, repent, return to your first love. You can do it right now. Let's pray together. Lord, we are pulled away by so many things of this world. So many things that catch our eye and lure our hearts. Lord, we can be even so busy doing the right thing, the good thing, the call, the purpose of the church. But in the midst of our work for the Lord, we forget the Lord of our work. So, Lord, we pray, we pray wherever we are, Lord, that you will, by your spirit, rekindle and draw us back, that we will be convicted, that we will come humbly recognizing that we have forgotten, neglected, even forsaken our first love, and know that you, by your grace, call us back, that we may be once again living out of our relationship with you, and filled with a passion for you. We pray this in the powerful name of our Savior Jesus. Amen and amen.
And so, as we continue to worship, we're going to be singing together, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And you may wonder, why are we singing this one? Is there a reason? Yes, I want you to listen especially to that last verse where we hear not only the writer of the sin, but it's our own heart as well. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for my courts above. Oh, our first and greatest love. pray that that, that that hymn has been your prayer and, and in that spirit let's go to the Lord in prayer let's pray together Lord as we come we come as those who dedicate ourselves to you that part of our devotion of you is living our lives for you that the work doesn't become the focus but our worship of you driving our work but we Lord we pray that we that all of ourselves our ambitions, our energies, our focus, our giftedness, our, our energy, our, our love, our, our financial resources, our very lives may be given to you, used for your service, our first love. So we dedicate our lives, we dedicate the gifts that we bring in this time unto you. We pray that you use them and use us so that we are all the more enthralled by your love and that this world may encounter the bridegroom Jesus, and that we together worship and draw close to our first love. And Lord, we pray, we pray for those in the midst of hurt and struggle and pain, those who are missing connection and embrace. Lord, as we look at this world full of violence and chaos in our cities, in our streets, in our nation, in our world, Lord, you have called us to be a light in the darkness, to be that lampstand. You have called us to be your ministers of reconciliation because it's about relationship with you. You have called us to be bringers and bearers of your hope and healing where there is brokenness. Lord, we pray that you work in us because apart from you, we can do nothing. Lord, we can, we can reflect your light, the light of the Son of God, the light of our first love. 
Lord, we pray that you, by your spirit and grace, enable us to do so for your glory. And we pray all these things in the name of the one who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In a moment, we will close the service with our postlude. And again, we want to thank Pam for preparing this and leading us in in Christ alone. If, if you're not familiar with the, the hymn in Christ alone, we encourage you to, uh, to look that up, to hear those words. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful hymns, speaking to the fact that it is in Christ alone that we are forgiven, that we have life, that we are able to draw close to him who is our love. And so with that, I give this benediction, this blessing. This is my prayer for you, that your love for Christ and for one another may abound more and more as you grow in the knowledge and grace of God. Amen and amen.